I know what you're thinking. Joe, I don't recall seeing this on the list of suggestions, and that's because it wasn't. You see, my birthday is this week, so I thought I would take the opportunity to discuss a game that had a significant impact on me as a kid, and helped me become the person I am today. So, welcome to Deja Vu, the show where I look back on a piece of media that I already know about, and tell you a bit about it. This time, by request of myself, I will be experiencing Deja Vu for Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet and Clank is a mascot platformer from the PlayStation 2 era. It features Ratchet, this gun-toting redneck who wants to leave his home planet, and Clank, a robot from a production line meant for more battle-smart machines who discovers a sinister plot that they want to prevent. Their journey begins shortly after Clank crash lands on Ratchet's home planet, and what follows is the exploration of several worlds that the duo will attempt to save. The gameplay of Ratchet and Clank isn't anything spectacular. You run around whatever area you're in, jump, attack, and collect currency. What separates Ratchet and Clank from other titles is the variety of tools at your disposal and the striking setting. Every few planets or so, you get the option to buy another weapon. Most weapons are distinct enough that you can easily discern which one is better suited for each situation. For instance, going up against several smaller enemies would be tedious without the Ferocitor. In contrast, should you be faced with an enemy with more reach, you can take them out safely with the Blaster. Each weapon at your disposal is varied enough to experiment with. For instance, let's say you're facing a horde of smaller enemies, which with your limited health can be just as dangerous as a single boss. With a full arsenal, you could lure them with a decoy and take them out with the bomb glove, spin around like a maniac with a ferocitor, shoot them one by one with a blaster, or if you're feeling skillful, charge in with not but your wrench and whack some alien hide. Slightly less varied than the weapons are the gadgets and how the game implements their use. Once you have the swing shot or the grind boots, there's not much variance in how you can use them. But there is another trick that the game uses to encourage exploration you will rarely ever reach a planet that you can fully explore on your first run. Several secrets in each level require late game gear to access. For instance, the very first level, Novalis, has a river flowing through it that comes out of a tunnel. The upgrade needed to fight the current and swim through the tunnel is not available until one of the last levels. Or the Blarg Tactical Research Station, an earlier location, only Clank can access the exterior until you pick up the O2 mask from a mid-game level. That leads me to my second point. The developers have meticulously designed each level of Ratchet & Clank not only to be a functional, challenging level, but also to ensure that each stage is aesthetically varied. Kerwan is bright and bustling, whereas Iridia is dark and industrial. Pokitaru is clean and inviting, especially compared with the filthy, toxic mess that is Auxin. And just to add the cherry on top, each loading screen is superimposed with clips of Ratchet flying his ship to the next location. It is at this point that I will issue a spoiler warning for the game. If you have access to a PlayStation 3 and what I've said so far has piqued your interest, then I suggest that you skip to the timecode on screen. I believe that Ratchet & Clank has a story that not only puts the rest of the franchise to shame, but most modern games, and film adaptations, as well. The overarching conflict that begins and concludes the plot is that a character named Executive Chairman Drek wants to construct a new planet out of chunks of others. Everything from his suit, to his title of Executive Chairman, to his motivations all contributes to the narrative's criticism against undisputed capitalism. Yes, I'm serious. Drek is a businessman. The destruction of planets is a part of a business venture. He seeks to make as much profit as he can, despite the irreversible damage he is inflicting. Gee, I wonder where I've heard that before. The game further establishes this criticism in a few ways, most notably by the way it forces the player to buy crucial plot items when most games would provide them. Or through interactions with NPCs, most famously the plumber, when he explicitly says that he is stranded in a war zone due to socio-economic disparity. What? He hasn't got enough bolts. All sorts of characters contribute to this running theme, from Quark's underpaid bouncer to Drek's poorly treated scientists. But if there is one character other than Drek who represents the dangers of dystopian level capitalism, it's Captain Quark. The narrative initially portrays Captain Quark as the galaxy's greatest hero. This is the reason that Clanks begins searching for him in the first place. But once you find him, he lures you into a trap that many have likely fallen for, and it nearly kills you. 
It becomes clear from that point that Captain Quark isn't as much a hero as he is a celebrity. A celebrity with no integrity at that. Quark doesn't want to do anything about Drek's scheme because he is on Drek's payroll. So as an alienated 18 year old and a robotic newborn, Ratchet and Clank are seemingly the only ones who have not been tainted by their society, and are therefore the only ones who can help. However, their bond does not form that smoothly. Ratchet and Clank begin the narrative as total strangers. They only take up travelling together because Clank needs a ride, and Ratchet needs someone to start his ship. Once Captain Quark betrays them, Ratchet is furious not only at Quark, but with Clank for dragging him into this mess. They still stick together out of necessity, but neither seems all that eager to do so. Both characters have flaws to overcome. Clank's naivety almost got them both killed, and Ratchet's arrogance is keeping him from seeing the bigger picture. By the end of the story, Ratchet can see past his ego to the damage being done to the galaxy by Drek, and Clank learns to be more discerning and empathetic towards Ratchet, and the two become best friends in a way that makes sense. They've grown together, saved each other's lives, and through their adversity became a more robust pair. Unlike another story I know, but this video isn't about that. As a kid, the only games I played were Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on PC, yes, that one, and some children's point-and-click adventure games. Ratchet and Clank was the very first game that I ever owned, and the first game that opened my eyes to just how fantastic video games could be. Ratchet and Clank made me a gamer, and without that I likely wouldn't be a nerd at all. I didn't get into Star Wars until I played the LEGO games. Star Wars got me into geeky movies in general, and it was that interest that got me connected with the right people who eventually suggested that I give anime a go. And it all comes back to that beautiful, simple little game. Sure, the mechanics aren't as refined as those in the later entries, and the story isn't any sort of masterpiece, but this game will always hold a special place in my heart. And I will always be grateful to the fine folks at Insomniac, yes, the Spider-Man guys, for bringing us such an excellent little game. And that is it for this episode of Deja Vu. I'd like to thank my patrons, Orion Train, Quincy Chamberlain, German 5 Lars Espen, Shark, Data52, NerxU, Pixcalibur, Alberto Cruz, Tyler Bennett, Tenka, and Jeremy Pashik. If you too would like to support the channel further, you can do so at patreon.com slash behind Big Joe. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time.